Uh, so welcome to the fifth and final episode of The Good and the Bad of Black Grad with Dr. Evelyn Asidu. This episode is titled A Year in Review, What's Next and Where Are We At? If you are joining us from the conference, welcome back to the 59th Annual KEGS Conference. Bienvenue encore au 59 e Congrès Annuel de l'Association Canadienne pour les Études Supérieures. My name is Ian Worley and I'm the Executive Director of KEGS. Next, I would like to acknowledge that this conference and this session is being hosted virtually from the City of Ottawa, which is built on unceded Algonquin and Anishinaabe territory. KEGS and everyone gathered here today pays respect to the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians of this land. We acknowledge their long-standing relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. We pay respect to all Indigenous people in this region, from all nations across Canada, and who all call Ottawa home. We acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honour their courageous leaders, past, present, and future. I would now like to introduce the executive producer and host of this series, Dr. Evelyn Esiadu. Now, earlier, Evelyn sent me a bio, but I seem to have deleted it, so I think I'll just go off the cuff here. Evelyn Asiadu recently completed her PhD at the University of Alberta and is currently working as a postdoctoral fellow. I will allow her to elaborate on that point. Uh, and she has been the courageous uh, executive producer and host of the Good and the Bad of Black Grad webinar series, which we are delighted to, uh, to help provide through CAGS and just really enjoyed working with Evelyn. And I'll now turn the mic over to you. Thanks, Ian. It's just one of those days, in it, isn't it, where you're like, I have everything in order. And then actually, somewhere. it's somewhere. It's somewhere in the matrix. Yeah. Thanks for that intro. Um, as, um, as Ian mentioned, I am uh, the executive producer and host of this webinar series, The Good and the Bad of Black Grad. And I'm currently doing a, a postdoc at Thompson Rivers University. I'm actually the first um, postdoc in um, equity and diversity data analysis. Um, I also do research data management and will be doing some amount of policy analysis. So it's a very mouthy title, which Ian, you probably wouldn't have been able to say. So that's absolutely fine. <laughs> Thank you. To, <laughs> it's absolutely fine that you weren't able to find my title. So this webinar series was, was born out of the ideas of, of many Black academics. Um, I, it started as a small um, idea and, and question that I had in my mind and I, I convened with some some close friends and peers about what were the things that we wanted to talk about and what were the things that we wanted people to know and so um, from that stem this amazing webinar series which we're actually on the fifth and last episode so this is kind of a fun and sad um, farewell kind of um, review um, hence the title, you know, the good and the bad of black grad, um, what's next and where are we at? And so before we launch into the discussion, I will mention that um, this is a space where we share our own perspectives um, and the panelists have kindly joined me with their with their time and, and their life experience. And um, with that, we, we give them the space to, to bring their whole selves, uh, but that does not mean that we will tolerate any sort of um, hate or, or, or um, um, inappropriate language. And so that is pretty much it. And I think we'll just launch into it with a round of introductions. So um, maybe we'll start with Brittany. Um, <laughs> hi, thanks for joining us. I would like to start with just uh, your research elevator pitch. If you were to describe what you do to all the lovely people in the room, how would you say it in less than two minutes? Sure. Um, well, my name's uh, Brittany Morrison. Thanks for having me, Evelyn. Um, actually, my sister, Melanie Morrison, was on uh, the first episode, I think it was. Uh, good bad of a grad. Uh, I am a master's student at Royal Rhodes University. I'm uh, studying uh, in an interdisciplinary studies program. Um, my research interests are Indigenous food sovereignty, um, particularly in Canada and food ways. Um, I also have a deep love for wine, so I've just recently uh, started exploring uh, diversity in the wine industry. Uh, it's a, a, an area that hasn't been um, explored very deeply, so um, that, that's uh, that's what I do in my academic life. Uh, in my um, professional life, uh, I uh, do public affairs and communications for infrastructure projects here in Toronto. Um, well, I say here in Toronto, I work on projects in Toronto, but I'm actually uh, speaking to you from Treaty 19. Uh, I'm in a very small town called Hillsburg in Ontario. So that's, uh, that's all about me. Amazing. Thanks for joining us, Brittany. I'm so glad that you're here. And um, we could probably do a whole episode about wine and uh, the love of wine that we share. And also the diversity or lack of diversity of people in wine, but we won't 
go there today. Thanks for the short summary. We'll move on next to Aisha. Um, if you are around, Aisha, can you let us know what do you do with your research? What brought you to this webinar? Um, and just, yeah, let's keep it under, to under two minutes. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Evelyn, for inviting me to this uh, great opportunity here to voice uh, my experiences as a Black undergraduate and um, yeah, so um, I am a mass, um, right now I'm a PhD student at McGill University. I am studying educational uh, studies, specializing in language acquisition. Uh, my background is actually, I have a master's in uh, linguistics, uh, uh, master's of arts of science in linguistics. And, um, you know, it was such a different um, field that I'm in uh, right now in terms of the theoretical frameworks, uh, typically in linguistics, um, you know, we kind of pretend that language occurs, you know, in a vacuum relative to social issues. And um, currently in my PhD, I'm really happy that I am looking at uh, language in, um, you know, conjunction with uh, sociocultural um, um, issues. And yeah, so, so far, um, you know, I'm back to my uh, hometown, Montreal. Um, and, um, you know, I did my master's in uh, U of A where I met Evelyn. Um, and it's nice to, you know, sort of uh, reminisce and be nostalgic for a bit when, when, I, when we're doing this. Um, and yeah, that is uh, pretty much about me. Um, excuse me for not being able to join in with video here. I'm having some technical difficulties. Um, uh, my Wi-Fi is just terrible at the moment. That's okay. I mean, like we said, it's one of those days. The theme music, um, which we chose for today was Life is Fine, because it, it is fine. So um, thanks for joining us, despite your technical difficulties, Aisha. We're so glad to have you. Last but not least, my friend, Prof Collins, tell us about yourself, including your name. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm Really thankful for this invite. My name is Prof. Colin Zifonu. Um, the prof doesn't actually stand for professor. It's my actual name. Um, um, otherwise, I thought know. Brittany's eyebrows go up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Pro <laughs> yeah, it's my actual name. There's a long story behind that name that I don't think we should get into right now. Um, I'm a doctoral candidate in sociology at the University of Alberta. Um, I'm also um, the president of the Black Graduates, the U of A's Black Graduate Students Association. Um, I've been um, president for the past two years, and it was in that capacity that I met Eve. Um, we've done a lot of lovely work together. Um, my research interests are really in the area of um, studying like, the political participation of non-citizens. Um, I have a particular focus on, um, at the moment, so my thesis will cover um, black international students and their relationship to anti-black mobilizing in Alberta. Um, and yeah, that's, that's, I'm Nigerian born and raised. Um, I moved over to the UK when I was 12 and I moved to Canada for my PhD. So yeah. Thanks, Prof. Yeah, Prof and I have a good relationship, so I, I tend to, to pick on him. So don't, nobody be afraid for him. He can handle it. If I'm making fun of him, it's because we're, we're good friends. Um, so that's, this, this is our panel. We're so excited to have all these students and we'll just launch right into it. So again, this episode is a, a year in review. So we want to reflect on what we've seen happen in the last, I, I don't know, let's say 16, 18 months, um, really kind of uh, capitulating from the death of George Floyd. And although he was an American citizen, a lot of the protests um, which which ensued following his his murder were uh, carried impact across across North America and, and, and great impact here in Canada. And so um, we've seen or maybe haven't seen a number of changes um, within academia. And so the, my first question is, um, is there anything that sticks out in your minds in terms of what has changed um, in the last 18 months? And um, do you think we're in heading in the right direction? Kind of a general, general um, reflective question. So, because um, Prof's face is still on my screen. So I'm gonna ask you first to dig into that, that answer, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think that, um, I think there has been change in the last 12 to 18 months. and but, but for me, um, I think that maybe the most profound change is, I think social just social justice slash racial justice movements and activism have kind of become institutionalized. And what I mean by that is, I think now we see 
Um, whereas in the past, um, I think maybe there was a, a bit of a hesitancy around, you know, sort of big corporations and, um, you know, companies attaching themselves to um, movements such as, you know, Black Lives Matter and so on. What we now see is kind of an embracing of these movements. Um, um, I think, uh, I think we, Ed, um, Edmonton just elected a new uh, mayor a few weeks ago, and I was reading yesterday that, you know, there was a unanimous um, approval of an anti-racism strategy. Um, so I think what, what we're seeing is, 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 I, it's it's kind of hard to 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 it's kind of hard to get away from it. I think even Ben and Jerry's has like a whole you know they've 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 put out some statements around you know policing and 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 so on. So you know when I compare it when I compare the current moment that we're in to my experience as an undergraduate or a master's student, which is you know sort of five six years ago, I think things have changed you know enormously. Um, conversations around race and racism are no longer, they're no longer conversations that you have at the back of the class, or they're no longer conversations that you have in, you know, little circles. They, we, what we now see is, you know, institutions putting themselves, um, <clears throat> attaching themselves, you know, to these conversations, contributing to these conversations, um, in, in some ways, you know, some people spearheading these conversations, um, and, you know, the positives and the, 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 the negative effects of that, we can discuss at a later time. But I think that for me has been the most profound change. I think it's just the, the embrace and, the, and, and with it, the institutionalization of, 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 um, of social justice movements so, or racial justice movements, I think, to be more concise. Thank you. Thanks, Prof. Would you agree with that, Brittany? Um, or, or do you have some other thoughts to lend about how things have changed in, in, in your perspective? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree um, with Prof. Um, you know, at the most basic level, the public discourse has just like been amplified uh, more than we've ever seen, at least in my lifetime. Um, you know, I thought about examples and I think back to this example of when I was in doing my undergraduate degree. And so um, I, uh, my alma mater, um, which I will say the name for the benefit of the folks on this call, Ryerson University, um, it's a university in Toronto. And I, I say the name only for, like I said, the benefit of folks on this call, because it's currently being referred to as X University or our university. Um, the university is named after a long deceased um, educator who played a fundamental role in shaping and defining the residential school system in Canada. Um, I think everybody knows what that is if you don't Google it. Um, but, uh, you know, at the time when I started my undergraduate degree, that was 2007, um, there were long calls to change the name of the university. Um, that was several years ago, and it was well known to staff and students what, um, you know, you know, what the role he played in that. Um, only now, uh, you know, post George Floyd era, have we seen the monument toppled and the university finally changing its name, which is great. Um, shouldn't have taken that long, but it's great that it's happening. And so um, I, I, you know, I like to look at that with like positively that there's been some very good change that has come about. Another big indicator for me is the way people perceive the Black Lives Matter movement. It was sort of, um, if you think back to a Pride Parade 2015, was it, I think, um, you know, it was like, BLM was this rogue organization that stopped a pride parade. They weren't allies, they weren't supportive, and they had basically ruined this really great thing. And, uh, you know, now it's an organization that people are happy to be associated with. And that, like, you know, Prof said, we're seeing these organizations come out and support and, um, you know, flags. I, I mean, I can tell you, I live in a small town and I see BLM signs and flags on, on uh, these farm properties. So um, there's there's been pretty like a monumentous change in um, the way that people receive um, organizations who promote Black interests and, um, and just equity seeking groups in general, I think. So that's been in the last 18 months for me, the biggest change that I've seen. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's hopeful in some ways, like 
I know that I can't speak for everyone, but sometimes when you know, I'm passing through or frequenting small towns, you kind of get your shoulders up a little bit. And that's um, just, just I think, kind of the defense mechanism that's in, inside all of us. It's not to say that small towns are bad or, or, or anything to that nature, but it's just kind of uh, personal histories. And so to see a flag like that uh, on a farm, like, yeah, that's amazing, really beautiful and amazing. Um, and, and so just touching on what bo you both have said in terms of um, the inst institutionalization of the BLM movement and the embracing of the BLM movement, um, it's kind of my sense is get on board or, or you get left behind um, for many institutions. But I think that that's been a challenge that um, throughout the various episodes we've been talking about in terms of what that means, the BLM movement um, in terms of um, if there perhaps are virtue, is there virtue single signaling and, and, and to what degree do we um, appreciate that exposure or feel that it's being capitalized on in terms of just, um, oh, we, we do this too. And so it's kind of a, a complicated question, but I, I was wanting to, to tap into uh, Aisha on her, your perspective of, of the BLM movement. Um, what do you think, virtue signaling, Jumping on board. What 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 is, what is this like complicated topic that we're trying to trying to talk about here? Well, thank you everybody for your important perspectives there. I definitely agree with uh, the amount of impact that happened. Uh, for me, it was in terms of uh, more internal. Um, there was more of I, I do see that there is a paradigm shift that's going on, uh, but uh, the magnitude for me was more internal. And as to um, the uh, the sort of uh, BML, whether um, or not um, it is engaging in some sort of performative activism. Um, it's always something important to ask and to uh, consider. Um, however, I think that we shouldn't really um, sort of um, not waste our time, but um, you know, overly focus on pointing fingers as to who is you know the most moral uh, or whose intention is the purest, etc. But rather, um, you know, focus on um, the effects or um, when it becomes dangerous, when performative activism becomes dangerous. And to me, and based on my experiences, um, um, performative activism becomes dangerous when uh, my voice as a Black graduate student is silenced. Um, you know, when um, when people, you know, say their, um, you know, declare their allegiance with. Um, movements such as BML or Black Lives Matter, excuse me, or, um, you know, declare their close proximity to um, a racial group and somehow, um, you know, their intention ultimately, um, their underlying intention is to, um, to silence uh, the Black cause and to uh, create a false narrative. Um, and that is when it becomes dangerous. And I think that's when we need to um, uh, be really careful um, and I have experienced this before, you know, I would see some either colleagues or uh, quote unquote allies, right, that would, um, that would, um, you know, um, uh, declare their close proximity, say, you know, I have a black sister, or I mean, a wife or um, um, stepsister or whatever, and then that somehow gives them the license or makes them immune to some sort of uh, to racism or makes um, you know, uh, or just uh, creates this false narrative that there is no more, there's no longer systemic racism. Um, I have uh, BLM in my bio, there's no longer these issues. Uh, what are you talking about? Uh, so for me, yes, um, there are, I think with every social justice movement, it is inevitable to um, uh, not see any virtue sing signaling, right? That's the nature of politics, right? When, especially when issues are, are politicized and there are political movements, um, it is inevitable, but I think it's just, uh, there's really no point in engaging in that gutter game where you're just like, uh, you're the you're you're the moral person that is the most genuine for the cause. You're the woke, um, you know, and, and y'all are, you're not woke, right? Um, uh, but just, you know, always um, highlighting uh, when it's dangerous, which is the outcome of it. Um, and I think that when it comes to institutions, actually, 
um, the the biggest issue when it comes to performative activism is uh, tokenizing, right? Tokenism is a tokenism is actually a form of performative activism. If you think about it, right, on the end of the institution when they're recruiting all these black students just because they're black, you know, like they're not here for. Um, I mean, that's the point. That's what they're trying to achieve, right? Here are the numbers. You know, this is just a just looking at diversity only, right? Yeah, these are the numbers. Look at all these black students that were recruited. Uh, they are for X, Y, and Z, right? Um, yeah, so I think that uh, we can look at it from so many different angles and and really problematize it um, um, based on the risks and, and the false narrative that it creates for us and uh, the silencing that it uh, sort of um, achieves. Um. Absolutely. Absolutely, Aisha. So, so much wisdom. And, and I like I like the way that you put it in terms of um, we're not here to be the woke police because <laughs> that is a distraction from moving us forward as a, as a whole, but also, um, yeah, tokenism. It's, it's, it's careful. It's a, it's a hard line to walk, especially for institutions who are trying for the first time and wanting to do, to do the right thing. So I, I, I appreciate you bringing that up. And I had a, a, a follow-up question to that, um, just with respect to, um, the, the recruitment angle and and one of the things that has been positive for me is is seeing um, cluster hires. I know that um, a number of uh, Canadian institutions have been doing cluster hiring of black faculty. Um, I'm, I'm sure there are others who have who have focused um, the recruitment of black students. I have I haven't seen that myself yet, but I'm sure it exists. And um, so what Aisha, what you mentioned in terms of um, tokenism, I think it's it's something to think about and relates to the the issue of the pipeline or the, or the the leaky pipeline of recruitment of black people into these these higher education spaces so i just kind of wanted us to to dig into that a little bit in terms of um that line um we do want more black faces and 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 more brown and and lgbtq and and various diverse faces in these spaces but what does that mean and how to, how can it be done in the right way so um maybe i just wanted to to bug Prof here again with his this pensive finger on the lip about the the pipeline of of academia and just the question is I guess um, what else needs to be there how do we move past recruitment um, in terms of ensuring that these people are can do well and can thrive and can contribute um, productively to to the institution. Um, I think I think that. First of all, that's a it's a massive question. Um, yeah, I know. I, I'm one that you know doesn't really have a one size fits all solution. But I, I think, from my understanding, what I would like to see, like going forward, which I think would work, is kind of like a in terms of looking after that leaky pipeline or fixing that leaky pipeline. Um, I'd like to see like a joined up approach between various institutions, you know, both post-secondary, you know, from the K to 12 level to really address this problem of, if we're talking with about the topic of, you know, representation, right? We know that representation is, you know, it's, it, it's, its most overt sort of manifestation is at the post-secondary level, right? We see it as hardly, there's about one, two, three of us dispersed across various faculties and departments. But it happens that way because the issue starts way before post-secondary education, right? It starts at the K to 12 level. Dr. James has written extensively about, you know, the issues of black um, that um, a lot of black youth face, um, you know, being you know discouraged from going into certain programs, being encouraged to play sports instead of uh, instead of you know um, um, pursuing um, you know post-secondary education and so on. So. I think in terms of that leaky pipeline, for me, what I would like to see is maybe a joined up approach between, you know, the leaders or the people tasked with solving this issue, both at the K-12 level as well as in post-secondary education. So to ensure that there's something of a synergy in, in, the, in, 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 all, in, <clears throat> in all those efforts to cater to that pipeline, to ensure that, and that's just with getting people into university, and then, you know, everything that happens, you know, retention after that is also, you know, a huge topic in itself. But um, I'm, answering, I'm answering that question in the context of representation. I think what, what I would like to see is, is a joined up approach. You know, I would like to see um, a collaboration between, you know, the U of A, um, if using the University of Alberta as an example, if you really 
want to, if you really want more, you know, black, if you really want more black students, you have to know what's going on um, at the K to 12 level. We, there was a case that I think was about two years ago of, of a student who was asked if he had gang affiliations of a black boy who was asked if he had gang affiliations because he wore a durag to school. Um, and, you know, it's these little microaggressions um, um, and, you know, everything else that comes with it that 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 inevitably leads to that um, that inevitably informs that issue and you know causes that leaky pipeline. So um, so going forward, I don't know if there's any and if there are any examples in Canada uh, of this or of you know or provinces engaging in this sort of approach. But I think that there needs to be maybe more synergy and collaboration between um, institutions who are focused on on fixing this issue so that you know, so that the left hand kind of knows what the right hand is doing. So there's at least, there's, a, there's, a, there's at least, you know, um, a consistency in, in solving this issue. Otherwise, I think that there's too much maybe, I think efforts towards issue, fixing this issue, even though they're well-meaning, that sometimes they're a bit disjointed. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I appreciate that answer, Prof. And I, I apologize for laughing at the do-rag remark, because it just demonstrates like how, um, this connected, I guess, the different communities can be. I mean, for, you know, for myself, I mean, I being raised mostly in Brampton, a pretty diverse place, um, do-rags are just a part of the garb. Like you wear it, men wear it in the morning, sometimes women wear it in the morning or before bed, it keeps the hair in place. But someone who has no idea like about the cultural um, nuances of what a certain type of person lives and experiences will has can take something that is as um you know in, innocuous as a do-rag and, and affiliate it with a, a gang. It's just it's just so far fetched. So I couldn't I couldn't uh help but laugh. Uh, anyway, thanks for thanks for your answer, Prof. Um uh just turning it over slightly with relationship uh, in relation to to a pipeline but more of general general strategies. Um something that I have seen I'm hearing more about our, our equity, diversity, and inclusion um, policies. And so I'm hearing and seeing those being instituted in different uh, university capacities. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on this, um, maybe starting with Brittany in terms of um, generally, is this a good idea? Um, what have you heard and seen? And what should, what should universities be thinking about that maybe they aren't? Just general thoughts about EDI policies. Yeah, um, so yes. Great to have, but EDI is less of a policy to me and more of a value, a value that every organization should have. And it should be inherent in every policy that you have. Um, you know, the these like Fortune 500 companies um, pride themselves on their employees all speaking and living the values. And, you know, when you get into certain universities, especially very collegiate universities, I went to Ryerson University, very commuter style university. So it, you know, the university culture wasn't quite there, um, but uh, other universities really pride themselves in the values and like EDI without question should be one of those. And if you, you know, get either end of that acronym right, uh, you know, you really diversity should come naturally because if you're, if you create an, uh, an equitable and inclusive space, it makes space for all different kinds of people. Um, so I, you know, to me, it's a value. I spend a lot of time in my professional life working on, um, you know, EDI, um, you know, as it relates to engagement, how do we mean and meaningfully engage different groups, um, and what that looks like. And there's a lot of talk, you know, about virtue signaling on that and, uh, what's the right approach. And actually, um, when Aisha mentioned about, um, um, tokenizing. One of uh, the things that, you know, comes to mind for me is that, uh, you know, I like to err on the side of, of people being generally good um, and that, you know, people aren't necessarily uh, behaving a certain way because they, you know, mean to be hurtful or because they don't care. It's just that sometimes they just don't know. They don't know how to behave. So when something happens like, you know, blackout day on Instagram, um, they, think it showing allyship is posting a black square and and you know whether that's clumsy um or supportive like to me if, if it's on brand for you to to support black people then that's that's good with me you know um but i think part of making this change um is to help us i help 
inform allies when when things are clumsy and how they can be supportive without tokenizing. Um, so I'll just give you an example of something that I learned is like um, early on with land acknowledgements, um, we would always look in the university or in the workplace to find uh, an indigenous person to deliver the land acknowledgement. Um, and it was later, um, a, a First Nations colleague told me that you shouldn't do that because, you know, we know this was this was our land. We don't need to tell you that. You should be telling one another of that. Be an ally. And, uh, you know, I, I hadn't thought of it that way. And I thought, wow, like we, here we are tokenizing people, you know, when when the spirit of this thing was to, you know, advance their their interests and raise up their voices and raise awareness to something that's very important. So um, I, I try to just remember that, you know, when I'm frustrated at, you know, the way people are behaving and what, you know, I think sometimes maybe virtue signaling signaling is actually maybe just someone who's being clumsy in their attempt to be an ally and informing that ally is part of the other side of allyship. Um, so I just wanted to raise that because it came to mind. But yes, in terms of, of EDI, um, definitely important uh, at the bare minimum. And I think most universities now, of course, have colleges, any academic institution have them. But a policy isn't enough. It needs to be a value and it needs to be inherent in every part of the, the corporate or you know, institution fabric. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for that example, and thank you, thank you for your perspective there, Brittany. Um, yeah, I, it's everything that you said. I, I, I agree with, um, and I think touches on the point that um, um, it's more than just a, a policy. It's more than just a statement, but it is um, a value, and it's a, it's an action. And so, um, I did not define the the um, acronym, so that's my fault. EDI being equity, diversity, inclusion. And that relates to other uh, acronyms for it, um, where the, the last letter is added on. So that's equity, diversity, inclusion, um, and justice, or equity, diversity, inclusion, and decolonization. And both of those um, final letters are um, more of a call to action and, and more of a requirement to change, um, as opposed to just uh, identifying what's there um, and then assuming that things will change. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, just pivoting slightly here um, for in terms of questions, just to keep us all on our toes. Where are my questions here? Ah, yes. So <laughs> um, in terms of, of reflecting, I just want to, to ask you guys if you think, guys and girls, if you think that we've missed anything. If, have there been parts of this discussion, um, anti-racism, inclusion, et cetera, um, that have not received enough attention. Um, it's kind of a challenging question because it's like we're so focused on, on what's here in this circle and then tend to, to forget other pockets of, of people or issues that perhaps uh, are, are worthy of attention and, and are, are not um, discussed. And so I'm just wondering if there's anything that comes to mind um, for, for each of you. Um, I want to start with Aisha because well, because we haven't heard from her and also because I can't see your face and I just want to make sure you're good. And what are your thoughts? Can you hear me? You can't yes, yes. I, I missed like a good part of the of your oh, response sorry. and then it was just like very, um, it was breaking. But uh, what have you missed? Um, I think for, for me in terms of just looking at it through my lens and my discipline, I think that it's always important to kind of reach beyond traditional development goals like examining um, other inter intersects, intersects that are beyond just, you know, the canonical ones that we look at. Um, and for me, I think that it's always important to look at language, for example, just looking at language in, in relation to race and racialization mm -hmm. um, and advocating for, in the context of advocating for black students um, through every possible dimension. Um, and I think that this is, when it comes to language, it's often neglected. Um, and the logic behind it is that language is heavily in tied to identity um, and, uh, you know, um, having um, that um, uh, not represented in a proper way would ultimately affect one's well-being. So that's why it's very important to focus on Black language and how we can legitimize Black language um, in ways 
um, in, in, in many ways. We can do it in terms of policy, in terms of practices in academia, um, outside of academia. Um, and I want to maybe have start having conversations about that. And actually, that's what my research is on. I forgot to kind of mention that at the beginning. I was kind of worried about the Wi-Fi. Uh, but yeah, I'm interested in applying anti-Black linguistic pedagogy using a plurilingual frame. Um, and um, in, in doing- That sounds very so, fancy. Sorry, I just had to interrupt you because I, those are words that are so far out of my chemistry realm. And I'm like, <laughs> so I'm just going to need you to break that down, maybe use an example. I'm sure you were going that way, but I just had to interject. Right. You sound very, very smart, and I, I know you are already. So um, what does that look like? What does that look like in terms of- What does of that look like um, in terms of, so there are some uh, pedagogies out there that examine or apply a critical, critical lens uh, when it comes to language, but um, there've been certain newer pedagogies or um, that sort of put into perspective or um, center Blackness um, and Black rights. So education, when it comes to language, it should be intrinsically um, emancipatory. Like it shouldn't, like that should not be a secondary or peripheral thing. That should be a central thing. Because this comes from the framework that um, uh, academic English or standard English is white English. Um, and if you look at the history behind it and the, the context in which, um, you know, um, English or standard English came to be, it was in the light of, it was in terms of, it was a reaction occurring in the American context. Um, so just, you know, just going back to the idea that us transcending um, our typical, you know, traditional like uh, development goals into including race and language, what I would like to see is us having conversations about uh, legitimizing our identities, our plural identities, all of our identities as Blacks, um, through language. And we have a lot of things in common when it comes to that. Um, I mean, um, but uh, a lot of the, um, the issues uh, in terms of um, delegitimizing Black English, it happens every single day, but we are so desynthesized to it. Um, if an example of this is just the policy, how we're just speaking English. You know, I'm a multilingual, I speak a lot of languages, right? But I just, um, I'm always in spaces that see monolingualism as a norm. Most Blacks, uh, Black Canadians speak multiple languages and the norm for Black Canadians is to uh, not be monolingual. Their norm is to be plurilingual, right? Um, and uh, we see this in also the language standardizing. There's a lot of Creole uh, speakers, right? Um, whether it's the French or the English Creole, why can't we speak that in a, in a, in a you know, standard form? Why is that not as legitimate as white English? Um, so yeah, I might've gone on a little bit of a tangent there um, given That's my uh, research interest, but I just the way I, what we miss sometimes is you know, looking at non-traditional um, dimensions and and incorporate that into our uh, emancipatory um, sort of mission when it comes to Black uh, 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 rights. Absolutely, absolutely. Such an in interesting thought uh, and one for us to consider. I think um, for, for my perspective, I'm learning, especially in this new role about um, language as a gateway and language as itself a barrier. And so if we think about it even beyond just the, the Black students and racialized students and, and their experiences, just in terms of access and allowing people to feel welcome and invited, we can um, subtly exclude people using certain words. Um, when I worked on worked with the, the city of Edmonton on their anti-racism task force, I found I, I, I found myself, you know, in that position where I was just talking the way that I talk and, and someone not directly, but called me out on it saying, you know, you have to use different words and slow down because we don't all think the same. And so I think that from a university standpoint, we, we use a lot of words and language that are very um, high level and fancy, um, but to some, to some degree it can be exclusionary um, and, and can signal to people that if you don't speak our language, you don't belong here. And I think that that's something for universities to also consider. Um, so thanks for that point, Aisha. I'm gonna turn it over to Prof because I know that you had a thought on this about things that we've missed. Um, what were you, what, what would you like to share with the crowd today? I think <clears throat> things that we've missed, I mean, there's always something, but I think something that's something that's been on my mind is really maybe just the future of student politics. Um, I think that a lot of social movements derive their exuberance and their momentum from students. Um, 
I, I think that we in, I guess, North America, Europe, and so on, I think we're in an interesting time where um, higher education as government funding for higher education has gone down. You know, these higher education is now big business. Um, institutions are now sort of privatized and, you know, a lot of the costs, a lot of the running costs of the university are being passed over or being shifted over to students as consumers. So the average student goes into university, um, um, you know, thousands of dollars in debt, um, and that's just getting at gaining admission. And then, you know, it's not, it's not, um, it's not unfamiliar to find, you know, an undergrad student who's maybe working two or three part-time jobs just to be able to afford, you know, living expenses um, or tuition and all of that. And um, and then, you know, there's also market pressures with the labor market, you know, placing pressures on you to be sort of a ready-made graduate, right? Um, you have, um, you, you're looking at entry-level positions and, you find that this is an entry level position, but for some reason they want you to have two to three years work experience. And you're like, where, where do I, where will I get that from? You know, like, is there somewhere where I can like buy work experience and put on my CV? You know what I mean? Um, and I think all of this has um, implications for how much time and how much investment students put into advocacy and the sustainability of advocacy. And I think what then happens now as a result of these increasingly prevalent neoliberal logics in which the um, higher education is run, um, student advocacy of which all of us as are beneficiaries of, like we shouldn't forget that black students were banned from certain universities um, in this country. Um, so student advocacy, which derives so I'm sorry, a lot of these movements which derive so much of their momentum from students, it then becomes reframed or it then becomes seen as a, as, a, as a leisure activity, as a luxury, as something that people can afford to do because you have the time or because you have the resources or because you have the energy, right? Um, I also think about this within the context of the internationalization of universities. Um, we we're just talking about EDI um, with the last question, right? If your if if your if your if your university's EDI policies is look how many international students we have, that's not an EDI policy. That's just your business plan, right? Um, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I have to interrupt again because it's funny that you say that, and it sounds kind of snarky, but I've I've actually heard from people who are um, higher up in admin at, at different institutions, I won't name where, who actually believe that having an X number of international students means that you're, it's like that we're good and that it's good enough. And so I'll just, I'll just let you continue because it's, it's actually a fact, yeah. even though I'm laughing, it's, it's yeah. people actually think that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, international students are like the poster children for like EDI, you know, you know, when it's time, they just, they, they call us, they line us up and then they take pictures. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, so yeah, um, so I'm, I'm thinking about this, this, it's all connected, right, because, into, because as a result of government, uh, you know, the, the reduction of government funding and public, um, public funding for, um, for universities, universities have now become bigness, they've privatized, and now international students are now, you know, being recruited in mass numbers to supplement university budgets. And, you know, in some ways, this is also connected to the immigration policies of various provinces. It's a, it's, 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 it's a, it's a huge monster. So I'm thinking about this within the context of student politics and how much, and like I said before, so many of these movements are from the unpaid and sometimes unrewarded labor of, of students, right? You look at all of the pictures of these, of, 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 of BLM or so on. I mean, BLM has chapters at different universities. The makeup of the student population is changing as well as the socioeconomic conditions of students. Students are poorer today than they were, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. So I, I guess that's, that's an interest of mine to see how, you know, this develops and what this means in the context of racial advocacy at the student level and, you know, more and wider, you know, more, more generally. So, yeah. really? Absolutely. You bring up a, a number of good points. And I mean, Prof Collins, folks, he does want to be a prof despite the name and that fact that he is not yet a prof. So very good. Very good points, sir. Thank you so much. You bring up a few things that I've also been thinking about. Um, 
in terms of the discussion of international students, I think that that's, this is um, a subgroup, uh, subpopulation of students that we don't talk about enough. Um, I, you know, Canadian born, um, Guinean, African Canadian person, didn't necessarily spend a lot of time thinking about the, the experiences of those people. Although when um, we were advocating and, and in at the U of A, um, we did form as a group with many student groups, which were largely comprised of international students. So um, as much as we're, you know, not a monolith, when, it, when we get to the university, unfortunately, or fortunately, we, we experience a lot of the same things. And sometimes that that is that is racism. So international, international, international students specifically face their own challenges. And I had, I think, if I'm honest, I had stereotypes about international students, and I assumed that they were all rich. I'm like, okay, who's your who's your daddy? How'd you get here? <laughs> kind of thing. And that's that's completely false. And, and so I say that to, to show that I, I too have my, my biases and I've been learning about that. And there, um, I mentioned it in one of the previous episodes, but there is a podcast from Canalad talking about international students as big business and how they're recruited by, by these agents around the world. And sometimes they're not supported and there's a lot of money being exchanged back and forth. And it, it, it does, it does render many in, in, um, quite destitute situations, um, especially when it comes to financial finances. So I think that that's um, a subpopulation of students, um, Black or otherwise, which universities should be focusing on. And it's not enough just to recruit. I think there's there should be more conscious efforts to support students when they get here or get there, wherever that is in your institution. And if I may just add, I think that yes, you may. at least at least in the lit in the way that literature portrays international student issues, I think they're sort of seen as separate from racial issues. But I think what this ignores is that the vast majority of international students are recruited from the global south. The, um, if you look at the numbers of the top ten um, source regions for international students in Canada, um, I think China and India um are you know are account for i think just over 50 percent nigeria yeah, okay. is nigeria mm -hmm. the most populous black country in the world is number nine on that list so international students by virtue of where they come from and by virtue of the fact that these are racialized people coming into a society where race is a visible marker of identity and race is carries you know the color of one's skin carries you know grave social implica um, social implications these are inherently racial issues um, uh, and like I said, this is something that it's now, uh, it's, it's, it's so central to Canada's nation building project. If you look at Alberta's international um, education strategy for the next five years, one of the priorities is recruit more international students, diversify the source regions. If you look at certain documents from colleges and institutes Canada, they're like, it's, 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 a, it's, it's, it, it, it's, the, the level of detail that they go into about like how they recruit, you know, setting up infrastructure in, in these countries, um, you know, pro, um, and, and, and the metrics that's used to measure, you know, what country is a, is a viable source. Um, and all of these countries are all, you know, racialized people. It's majority, you know, if I can say that it's majority, black people or, or, or and so on and so forth. So, you know, I think this carries, we, we, we won't see, the effect of this for, you know, or we're already seeing the effect of this, as you said, you and I know, and even in our organizing here at, at, at the U of A, it's, it, 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 it brings up different issues around legitimacy and seeing oneself in the movement and also coping with the realities of being an international student, of having your, having your, sta having your status in the country um, tied to your academic performance and ac your academic progress. So yeah, I, I think it's definitely it's something that's receiving more coverage, and I will keep quiet now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Thanks. Yeah, sorry. Kind of well, talk about tangents. We definitely want a tangent there. Just want to check in with with Brittany. Uh, hey, girl. Any thoughts about things that we've we've missed in terms of this anti-black racism discussion in the last eighteen months? I I mean I, I'm not sure anything that we've missed. I'm thinking. I think something that hasn't really presented itself yet, but you know, in the context of like academia and the COVID-19 uh, situation is what will the impact be to equity seeking groups who um, have now been a, almost a year and a half were, you know, virtual. Absolutely. And uh, it's a totally new environment like that we're operating in, you know, everybody knew what I looked like and who I was when I did my undergraduate degree. Now, my master's degree, nobody's seen me. 
Yeah. So it, it's interesting. I don't know what the impact will be. I don't know if it will be positive or, um, you know, if it will perpetuate the, um, um, you know, the, the areas that already um, are a problem. So we'll see. Um, yeah. But it's something that that's definitely worth um, looking into. And, you know, of course, uh, since everyone's talking about their research interests, I always have to bring up uh, food sovereignty. Um, and we're increasingly seeing uh, Black food sovereignty as a theme, particularly in development. Um, you know, there's a great book uh, by Leah Penniman uh, called Farming While Black. Um, it's a great one. Everyone should go read it. Um, but it, but it's a, it's a really, um, you know, we're talking about creating um, spaces that are inclusive. Um, it's an important discussion to have. Like, are we are we creating food systems and access to food and land that um, is fair and equitable? And I think everybody, um, you know, for for all different kinds of groups, white people, black people, everybody, um, and you know, people like to you know think that it's just land and that you know the you know once you get land and then that's tax. But the the truth is that people live in food deserts. Um, you know, people don't have access to culturally appropriate food. Um, and, you know, if we're, if we, but we're building academic business models, uh, you know, on international students, well, if we're going to bring people here, it is like the responsible thing to do is to make sure that they have access to the food that is culturally appropriate for them. Um, and so anyway, it's an important theme and it, it's gaining more and more, um, you know, um, traction. So one to look out for, but definitely in the context of, of ac academia, I'm, I'm interested to see what remote learning is going to do for um, the Black cause and all other causes for folks, you know, when there's no face to the name. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. You, yeah. You just, you guys, you're all great. Like, just be saying things that I've never thought about. And <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> like, if, if we are thinking about, unfortunately, universities, institutions now as business, and the model is largely focused on people who are not from here, it kind of speaks, what you've said kind of speaks to the support systems for those people when they arrived and, and belonging and bringing their whole selves to a new environment. And food is such a huge part of that. And so, yeah, access to, to food and, and food that is familiar, familiar um, and comforting is a huge, huge thing. And, and I don't necessarily know that it's part of any type of strategic plan. Um, and I'm not at the top, so I can't say one way or another, but definitely something to be considered. So thank you for bringing up that point. Amazing. Amazing. What other questions do I have for you guys? Um, slowly, it's just going to kind of wrap up before we call on our professor here. Um, kind of, I guess, looking to the future in terms of what's next and what do we hope to see? So um, those are two questions, but you can either answer one or the other or answer them both um, as we're wrapping up the series um, and as as we're wrapping up your time here on, on the episode slowly, you know, another few minutes. Uh, what what's next for for us in as as black people in this institution in higher higher education and for institutions at large, um, you can answer with respect to allyship or, or structures, what do you think. Um, needs to change, um, what good things do you see, and um, what do you hope to see, I guess, in the next um, one, five, ten years? Um, so I'll start with Aisha um, with respect to this question. Great question. Um, in terms of what's next, uh, just looking at this, there's a lot, obviously, that needs to be done, but in terms of the student, uh, the Black student experience, um, I'm just going to elaborate a little bit on what I hope to see. Um, uh, as we know, you know, we're not a monolithic group, right, but we do have uh, similar experiences, particularly when it comes to the experience of feeling uh, isolation, right, um, a lack of belonging, um, and this is all due to the underrepresentation of, you know, Black faculty, Black administration, uh, administrative leadership, um, and Black students as a whole, right, so I really hope that, you um, more and more efforts or more attention is um, is given to that aspect in terms of um, the outreach um, aspect um, of uh, of uh, of the institution. Um, diverse, not only just diversifying, but also um, uh, worrying about um, or putting emphasis in the inclusion aspect. And I think a lot of this has to do with uh, community outreach. Um, so you know, institutions going beyond its uh, local um, community, but 
uh, extending to uh, other communities uh, through uh, Black alumni, um, through various, various uh, creative ways. Um, and also just, um, there's many things about the Black experience, but an important thing is to have honest and uh, transparent conversations about um, the history of uh, Black Canadians um, and the role of that particular institution in the transatlantic uh, uh, trade slave, uh, slave trade, excuse me. Um, and having honest conversations about those and um, uh, having action plans and, po and policies that are that genuinely reflect um, the conversations that you have with the community, the Black community, um, and you know, removing uh, statues um, that are uh, symbolic of uh, the violence that Black community goes through on a daily basis, um, and um, and many more things. The curriculum, uh, you know, curricula having it reflect our demographic uh, diversity, um, you know, and including our um, Black professors, Black scholars um, that are often underrepresented and unvoiced, um, and many, many things. Um, but just to um, go from the, the question that you had before about what you expect to do after this series is over, I believe, um, I, I wanted to really, you know, take the time to thank you for having the, this series, because this series is a reflection of the conversations that a lot of some Black students actually don't have the uh, the privilege to uh, to have these conversations because of the lack of representation right and the lack of black fellow black students and you know for me you know like I, I really hope you know 10 years from now or however many years that we keep having these conversations however you know large scale or small scale whatever scale it is because these conversations for many black students are um you know um they are um validation in the sea of invalidation, you know, in a sea of constant, constant invalidation. And um, having these conversations have a tremendous effect on our well-being um, uh, in ways that people sometimes cannot understand and maybe, maybe even us, we can't understand and see. Aw, thanks, Aisha. Thanks for being here. Uh, you, you said so many important things um, to, to your last point about having these conversations. They, they fuel me and I know that they're important and there's so much we can learn from each other and 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 so talk about that forever but um in terms of the other things you've mentioned it, it a lot of it kind of relates to community so getting in touch with black alumni and connecting to them and, and, and in terms of thinking about that pipeline and recruitment and also um you kind of touch on um with these conversations creating spaces where people feel validated so so many points and uh, and, and things that we're looking forward to seeing so thanks for bringing that up i'm gonna go to Brittany now uh how about you what are your thoughts <laughs> yeah um so you know in terms of where we need to go the goal for me is always to be able to have these conversations but not have to have these conversations because i don't want to be characterized by the color of my skin you know and i don't think anybody does uh you know i don't want it to be an indicator of how likely I am to achieve a certain salary or a certain role or be represented in within a certain group um, or, you know, a level of attainment. And, you know, I don't want it to be the reason why I'm pulled over or the reason why I'm followed around a store. It's all silly. We don't need to be here. Uh, you know, unfortunately, I'm not sure that we'll move, you know, see that in my lifetime, but um, I think it's important that we keep having these conversations in order to facilitate action that will help us get to a better place for the generation after us um, and, and for ourselves, you know, <laughs> but, but you know, yeah. there's still still lots of work to do. Um, you know, I don't see it in any particular order. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, one of my first uh, one of my first uh, jobs in my adult life uh, was working at a research institute, the Diversity Institute for um, Technology and Innovation. And I worked as a research assistant doing diversity counts. Um, it was shocking to see how underrepresented at the time they were referred to, we were referred to as uh, visible minorities, um, you know, and how few on the top boards in media and education and government and, you know, political office, like a Fortune 500 companies it's just the lack of representation. So, you know, at a bare minimum, if you are in a place, um, you know, and I'm whatever group that you identify with or belong to, um, if you aren't taking, you know, if keeping track of the data, if you don't know the counts, you need to start doing that. 
uh, because it's the bare minimum that you can do, um, especially now, you know, we talk about what I was just talking about when you, you can't see um, the people who you're interacting with, you know, when people are working remotely, it's very important um, that we are keeping track of that. And I know people are hesitant to provide that information, but data helps us, you know, we should all know in academia, data helps us make informed decisions. Um, so at a bare minimum, we should be doing that. Um, when it comes to EDI, if you are in a place, an academic institution or, uh, you know, an organization or even just among your, you know, your peer group, um, that equity, diversity and inclusion is not um, a part of the fabric of where you are, then that's something that you should stand up and try to change. Um, and it's not just a policy, it's a value. It should be inherent in everything you do. And a good way of doing that is auditing your existing policies to, you know, make sure that they reflect to those values. Um, I think, uh, you know, the other thing is that there is no question that Black people face different preconditions than their non-Black peers. And that is one of the, uh, you know, if not the only reason that, you know, Black people face, you know, barriers to attainment in multiple areas in life. And it's due to a network of interconnected barriers that um, are often systemic. And so if there's any question about like, you know, deficit model or any of these things, um, the, this is not, uh, this is not because of some cosmic inadequacy that Black people have. Black people are just as capable as everybody else and we need to pat ourselves on the backs and remember that we make fantastic athletes, we make fantastic musicians, so there's no reason why we can't be leaders in STEM, why we can't be represented in public office and uh, you know all other areas of social life. Um, and the, the way to do that is to take the steps to make more inclusive spaces, to identify those preconditions and work through the systemic barriers that are preventing Black people from attaining um, and then, you know, as Black people, we need to, you know, the generation that comes after us, our children, we need to, um, you know, make them aware of that and do what we can to pave the way for them and talk to our non-Black friends and, you know, and allies and to um, try and, you know, continue to do the thankless work of <laughs> promoting our, our interests. So um, there's, you know, a ton of stuff that needs to be done, but I just think those are some, you know, key points that we can uh, we can hit to to move forward and try and make it a a better place and a, a you know better life for black people and everyone because i think when you i think i said this earlier but when you build for everyone you know you bring you raise everyone up absolutely absolutely my sister uh, stacy asiedu says amen mic drop so that's how people are feeling about what you've said thank you so much Brittany. so so many points I, I can't even i can't even recap you said it eloquently so I, I i won't add anything more to that thank you for your your uh final thoughts what about you prof um again pensive with the finger on a cheek what are you going to tell the people you, i mean how am i going to follow that up i mean <laughs> i don't know i, I, mean, I don't know <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, no i think um aisha and Brittany, you guys made such excellent points. The The only other thing I have to add is, I'm just going to go as, on record as saying this, is that I think ever since last year, I've, I've read a lot of work, I've read a lot about the white lash, and I fear it. Um, and I think, I think, and what I mean by that is, I feel like, you know, if you read like the history of the civil rights movement, and like, yeah, okay, we gave them civil rights. What else do they want? You know what I mean? It's like, there's always like, after like a period of progress, there's always this in-between period where it's like, okay, we gave you your cluster hires. We gave you, you know, we got like a new batch of international students from Guatemala. What else do you want now? You know what I mean? Like, um, and I and I guess I'm still in a moment where I'm, I don't know what that's gonna look like because I think that it is coming. Um, and I think maybe the debates around, you know, critical race theory in the U.S. in the in the U.S. are one manifestation of that. But as for you know, to answer your question more directly, um, I think it's really just about consistency and and accountability um, for anyone who's going into um, a university or already in one. Don't be afraid to just hold your university leaders accountable. Sometimes be attentive to certain documents that come out of the EDI office. You know, read those, read those documents, read those statements. Um, 
um, and hold them to it. You know, our, um, the U of A, um, the initiative, um, <clears throat> the U of A is a, is a signatory to the Scarborough National Charter on Anti-Black Racism, right? And there's a whole, you know, there's the there are detail, detail, there's detailed information out uh, on there on, on how, you know, the university plans to redress this issue. This is something that should be held that the, whoever is a signatory um, to this initiative should be held accountable for, you know, you've committed to this. So what next? It's not just about the cluster hires. It's not just about, you know, um, recruitment. It's also about retention. It's about scholarships and awards. It's about opportunities to be in the same way that other, and that's, that's only, that's the only thing that we've ever asked for is, is the opportunity to be just like everyone else. You know, we're not trying to take away anything from anybody. We're not trying to, you know, we're not, you know, uh, and when we do, when, and when there is something that is, you know, thrown our way, we're not being ungrateful and asking for more. These are things that we, ha we have an equal right to just like everyone else. So I think in terms of next steps, I, I think it's really just being attentive, being attentive. I, I wasn't as attentive a few years ago as I am now. Now I look at, you know, I look at certain documents that come out of, that come out of, you know, um, the university. And I'm like, why, why are we having to, like you, some of the things we're advocating for, like sometimes the university is already committed to doing it on paper, but because there was no attention or there was no, um, sure, follow up. There was no follow up. Yeah. The, like, so nobody's holding them, nobody's holding them accountable. So sometimes I'm just like, you said this, you said you were going to do this in this document. I can show you the page where you said this, you know? Um, so, um, so yeah, it's just, you know, not being afraid um, or not being hesitant to, to follow up and, um, and, and to seek that accountability because it's, it's what we deserve at the Absolutely. very least. Absolutely. Thanks, Prof. You guys are amazing. You guys are amazing. And you could take a break now while we bring on our next segment, Petition to Prof, and not Prof Collins, an actual professor. <laughs> so today we're fortunate to have uh, Dr. Carl James. I'll just read out his bio while he comes to the screen. Oh, I'm like a huge fangirl of, of, of Dr. James, so I'll just try and read this without stumbling. Uh, <laughs> Carly James is the John Augustine Chair in Education, Community, and Diaspora in the Faculty of Education at York University. He's a professor in the Faculty of Education and holds cross appointments in graduate programs of sociology, social and political thought, and social work. A fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and awarded an honorary degree from Uppsala University, Sweden. Dr. James is widely recognized locally, nationally, and internationally um, for his work in leadership and equity and social justice. He's been a visiting professor at a number of universities in Canada, Australia, and Sweden, where he taught part-time in the Department of Education at Uppsala University, among others, for about 15 years, from 90, 1997 to 2012. In his work, Dr. James seeks to encourage and support inquiries into issues and concerns of Black and other racialized Canadians. He advocates on education for change by documenting the struggles, contradictions, and paradoxes of experiences of racialized students at all levels of the education system. So with that, I'd like to bring on Dr. Carl James. Is he here? Thanks very much for having me and for inviting me to this very good discussion. Yes, thank you for being here. Yeah, so um, I've been on a few panels with you now, so you know my face, but the, the people here in this room have the, the luxury of getting you in the room and, and just picking your brain about what has been said here today, just general thoughts about where we've come to after these last 12 to 16 to 18 months um, as, as you know, Black academics and uh, academia on the whole and where we're going. I just wanted to hear just general thoughts because you have a, a lovely, lovely brain there, Mr. Mr. James. I liked the discussion, but I would have wanted to, to ask uh, Prof, Brett, and, Ev, uh, and Aisha to give me some, some more of their, uh, their ex how some of these that they've constructed come out of their experiences. And I like the idea, but, what I, I, I was, I, as I listened, I say, explain further, explain further, dig mm -hmm. deeper into your experience. Tell mm -hmm. me how your experience is, is helping and uh, what you're constructing. But in the end, everyone gave very good detailed kinds of 
references for the points they make. Uh, and, you know, uh, I, I, I'm thinking of some work we're doing, uh, wanting to compare what's happening in the US, what happens in Canada, and what happens in Britain since uh, George Floyd. And I think what Prof said about, about, about uh, these issues and how he constructed it, his, that, that last statement was very, very useful. And I, I thought, but one thing I picked up on that Prof said is, it's coming. You know, he, he constructed all these things. Oh yeah, we've, we've given you this cluster highs. We've given you these international students. We're giving you all these uh, anti-racism training or anti-bias training or unconscious bias training. We have listened, we have sponsored uh, people to come to you and give talks about anti-racism. What more do you want? And I think I'm left with that. So given that, uh, after all, given all what he just said lately, uh, at the end, how can we, how can we really think that is there any change then? Can we, or, or what we see happening, is there going to be any change? You know, uh, two weeks, uh, about two or three weeks ago, I, I talked with a, a grade 12 student. He's going into university next year and he, he, he was doing his own research. He's interested in computer science. And, and he, said, he says to me, uh, he sees all what's happening here as something that's just for now. So he says, by next year, next year, this is a this is a seventeen-year-old kid, black kid, saying by next year things are going to be back to where they were, and and so so we wonder about them. However, what we heard from uh, from Brit Brittany and Aisha, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, have me wondering about what we call the cruelty of hope. Oh, yeah. What kind of hope then? Uh, is hope, is this disguised hope or cruel hope or hope which like um, Freire talks about which, you know, this, we are now able to imagine a society that's different, that these things that we hope for will eventually come about. So I, I'm, I'm wondering about, having listened to this conversation, I'm wondering how much hope can we, uh, can we, uh, Put in, and one of the important thing. I know you have a question, but uh, what, what no, please go ahead. No, we we have a lot of time. Beyond the individual, beyond these, beyond these individual conversations, beyond these cluster highs, beyond have, bringing in international students, beyond having these uh, paying attention to all these things and having these nice words on paper. Uh, beyond that, individuals how much are we really advocating for institutional changes and structural changes? Because it cannot just happen in the classroom or these individual uh, training for, for professors or students or just simply given the curriculum. How much are we going to see this expressed in the larger society and in, and in the entire institution? Because we have to see that there's a relationship between what happens in the classroom and uh, it's been noted from K to from K to twelve, from what's happening there, what happens in our individual universities, and what happens uh, in the society generally. And it's, so it cannot be just us having this conversation. That conversation must be had in the larger society, and the media have a responsibility to also look at how they're presenting the messages. If if we only said if we only see black, black young people as being uh, athletes and musicians and not, and not seeing them telling us about the effects of COVID and the implications of that, what does that say uh, to, mm -hmm. to the black young person about imagining themselves in university and being able to get there? So yes, yeah, so I want us to push the conversation beyond just all these individual things to see institutional changes, and structural changes, societal changes. Because, you know, as, as many people have said here, every, just about everyone has noted that in many cases, universities 
have some of these words on paper and how much aren't we holding them to them? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So many things. Yeah. <laughs> so many interesting thoughts, uh, Dr. James. And um, I want you to know that you, we're, we have a, a bit of time. So if you did have any specific questions for our panelists, please feel free, free to ask. And one thing I want to say uh, about the cruelty of hope, um, I think in this moment, some of us are having the audacity to hope. Um, and I think that that's the other side of the same coin. And, and, and if not for hope, what, what do we have? You know, it's, it's sad, it's sad to think that um, a teenager, um, not even yet, it, it, having chosen a college or university is nervous that all of the, the commotion about Black Lives Matter will have diffused by the time he's ready to, to enter into this space. And um, I, I feel I feel sad to hear that, but I also know that that's, that's the truth for many of us, even myself, as I sit in this room, how long is it gonna last? So thank you for your, your points but, but here. We, are, we, are, we have, there is some, some healthiness to hope, you mm -hmm. know? But, but also seeing it as it's important, we're going to have to have, that's why we engage in these conversations. Absolutely. That's why we're going to talk to the politicians and our professors and our leaders, because we have to have some sense of possibilities for ourselves. After all, we cannot just simply say, no, it's not gonna happen. At the same time, we also have to balance it with how, how the structures are, like somebody put it as this big ship that's, mm -hmm. you know, sh that mm -hmm. needs to shift to shift and therefore there's a need to, to, so yes, I'm not saying no to hope, but we have to also think how do we in that hopefulness that we cultivate also move to start seeing as was talked about earlier, you, you know, these highs, etc. So one of my big questions yeah. that I have, For us very today. big question, and I wanted everybody to elaborate on it. What do, I did not get enough of that. What do they think, or what do you think of cluster hires? Ooh. Is it, is it, is it, um, can we be hopeful about it? Yeah, uh, sure. Is cluster hire uh, a way to go? And I want to hear, I would like to hear everyone's response to the idea of cluster hire. What do you think? Dr. James coming in like a pro. And, and, and I'm giving a warning. I, I'm, I'm willing, I'm going to be challenged. I'm going to challenge. Some of yeah, the ideas. you're going to serve the role that you know best to be a professor and lecturer and leader, and we're here for it. Um, who wants to jump in on that that response? Uh, anybody before I start picking picking out people? Maybe. Okay, here we go. <laughs> prof, prof, of course. Here we go. Go ahead. Sorry, I'm unmuted to say Brittany. <laughs> um, That's not how it works. <laughs> Sorry. Um. Oh. What do we think about cluster hires? I think they're good. I think the I think it's better than nothing. I think it's better than nothing. Um, um, I don't know. Um, okay, Brittany, <laughs> you're up next. <laughs> Just I have to come. Prof, Prof is still processing. Let, let's let's let give him a second and, and hear what do you think, Brittany? Cluster hires. I think it's an interim measure. Like it's a it's a tactical response to an issue, but it doesn't address the baseline, which is the fact that there are these systemic barriers that affect the ability of Black people or other equity-seeking groups to obtain the roles that they are perfectly capable of fulfilling. And so I'm fine with it being a tactical response in the interim, but I think the ultimate goal is that we become leaders in equity and inclusion and that we break down those systemic barriers so that we can naturally produce a diverse candidate pool. Um, yeah, say it again, sis. Yeah, no, I, was, I agree, I'm, but I'm not the one um, asking the question, so I'll just kind of chill out. Aisha, well, we're I think going to have to get your idea about this to oh, Evelyn. Go ahead. Oh, okay, okay, I'll go at the end. <laughs> Is Aisha still with us? Yes, I'm still with you. Thank you very much, Professor Carl, for that question there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that as Prof said, it is necessary, um, but um, like um, it's better than nothing in that sense, if I'm wording his words correctly there. And I think Brittany gave, gave a really perfect answer there um, for all of us. Um, 
And I think that the issue mainly with uh, this um, cluster hiring, again, would be what we discussed before, right? Um, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, signal of virtue would be the other issue. And we need to, you know, try to think about minimizing um, that um, in terms of um, uh, having genuine conversations uh, and looking at our intentions. Um, as to why we are taking particular measures when it comes to um, diversifying, quote unquote, um, uh, a certain, uh, you know, university um, faculty. Amazing. Okay, I think it's my turn now. Um, and the prof was going to also finish what he was going to say. Okay, okay. Let's let prof, let's prof, let prof go. Okay, yeah. So as I, as I said before, I think they're good. I think they're better than nothing. But I also agree with what Brittany and um, um, specifically stated about addressing the systemic um, issues that um, continue to plague sort of recruitment of black and racialized people. Um, I also think that cluster hires don't really, they get, they're good at getting people in the door, but doesn't really cater to what happens afterwards, right? Um, and these cluster highs, they're usually, you know, dispersed across various faculties in the university, right? So you have in the department where there was no black faculty member, now you get one and arts gets one and, you know, all of these other faculties get one. So, you know, zero to one is minimal progress to say the best or one to two is minimal. But then what then happens after? We know, um, um, I think Dr. James, you yourself and Francis Henry have written about experiences of BIPOC faculty after recruitment, um, written about how you get saddled with lots of, you know, responsibilities. If there's, you know, I know if I, in the UK as a master, um, as an undergrad student, there was hardly any black faculty members. And the one black faculty member that was there got, you know, swamped with mentoring because everybody rushed to, everybody rushed to him. This is, this is labor that is not um, factored into the metrics of you know, you know, how your, your performance is measured as an early career um, faculty member. Um, you're expected to serve on a million and one diversity and anti-racism committees. Um, so these are, these are all things that happen afterwards, right? So in, in short, um, in short, I think that again, it's better than nothing. We take how we take our wins. Um, wherever we can, you know, however, wherever, however we can get them. But, you know, there's also the issue of what happens after, right? The, what mm -hmm. happens after, you know, um, hiring. Okay, I think it's my turn now, right, Dr. James? Yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. So um, I'm going to say that I agree with all these fine people, um, because that's the easiest thing to do. No, I, I think that cluster hires are, are complicated. Um, as with uh, what my panelists have said, I think that they are a good place uh, to start. I think that they're an opportunity. I do realize that what, what we've kind of directed this conversation towards is the fact that um, it does not necessarily address the support system for those, uh, those faculty when they arrive and um, prepare them for the experiences that they may have being the one of the only or one of the few. And then, and then what happens after that in terms of do they leave um, and whatnot. Um, Prof touched on the, the topic of workload and how we how the institution necessarily values mentorship and um, um, community-based research, research and community engagement. I think that's another um, thing to, to consider. I also think one thing to consider is um, in terms of the backlash slash blacklash slash white lash is um, how do their peers perceive them? So let's say that I, for example, uh, join as a cluster hire. Um, which I'm not, I'm a postdoc now, so this is a hypothetical situation, but let's say that I jump onto the bandwagon and join because I have the opportunity. Then there's the whole situation of the proving yourself, which of course every every professor, once they're there, has to prove, prove themselves anyway. But then it's like, you know, you have perhaps other people in your faculty who are like, oh, you're, you're just here, you're just hired because you're black, just, just so you know, and we all don't think that you deserve to be here. So not, not only do you have to prove yourself in your academic work, because I mean, that's your, your professor and that's what you need to do, but then you need to prove yourself to your peers to ensure that they know that you know what you're doing. And it's, it, it's a difficult line to toe. I think it's almost impossible. So I think that there's a lot a lot that goes with cluster hires that aren't necessarily part of the general conversation and discourse. 
And that's why we're glad to have you here, Dr. James. What do you think? Uh, you know, I, I like the last point you just made because if you're hired as, uh, as a black faculty, that means that uh, the, the institution made certain, uh, probably there might be compromises, certain kinds of reservations, certain kinds of changes in order to, in order to get you there for. So I want to, so it's important for us to know how does the in, institution, or how do the colleagues with whom you're going to work understand black hiring uh, and, and understand, but consider this. Uh, for many years, universities have been talking about, we have had employment equity in the university. Universities have, have had equity and we have talked about equity and employment equity, put in place equity hiring. Consider that many, some of these many universities have got awards for their equity programs, you know, that shows that yes, you have been doing good work with equity. Not only universities, but businesses, lots of businesses, since uh, employment equity has been in place. If that's the case, if universities and businesses and others have been getting awards for having moved on employment equity, how is it in 2020 that these same places that used to get awards for these things are asking now to hire black people? Sounds contradictory, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it does. <laughs> but, but, they, but that doesn't mean that they are not good representation of racialized people in the, those, those places. That's why they would, so, so I, I forgot who used the word visible minority earlier. Uh, oh yes, let me use the word <laughs> visible minority. Notice, so we live in a, in a society, Canadian society where we have lumped all these racialized people as visible minority. And as visible minority, you're going to be counted as visible minority. And so therefore that the differences between all these groups are not going to be as significant because you're visible minority. So you, over the years then, the visible minority category, it used to be women, visible minority, people with disability and indigenous people. So indigenous, racialized, uh, in, uh, quote, unquote, I use the word racialized rather than visible. So the visible minority people have been lumped. And so, so therefore, having done that, when, when you're going to hire, therefore, it's not the black person, the South Asian or the Asian person or the Filipino, it's the visible minority that's going to be, uh, that's being. So therefore that has yielded that something. So therefore you have to wonder how is, how are they make, how do they been, have they been making sense of, of different experiences that come to that interviewing process based on their race? Obviously, it, Adequate work has not been done in that area. So my question becomes again, does this mean then that simply having black hires, is that, is that going to really change? Because are we going to have to constantly, next year, the year after that, and the year after that, be constantly saying, yes, please, if, if, if you're black, apply? Are we going to have to say that? Or are we going to move from just simply, and think that the system will eventually start moving in a way where everybody who applies will get the, the kinds of recognition that they need, including black applicants. What do you think? I don't want to go first. Uh, well, pretty. Yes, pretty. <laughs> On the, just even the term visible minority. So like, I mean, it, it raises a good point. This was, when I worked on that report, it was 2009. Um, and that was the term that was used to, you know, encapsulate anyone who basically wasn't white um, or like visually appeared as, you know, uh, not being white. So, um, you know, I feel like we've come a, a, a good, uh, 
you know, way from there that we at least have broken these into, uh, you know, categories like within that category, but, you know, we still are struggling with the, the monolith now of uh, black people and indigenous people, um, you know, so there's still so much work to do, but you, you raise a, a really good point about, um, you know, people were receiving awards. And I think like we need to to ask ourselves like, is that weird that we're we're giving out awards to people for doing the the right thing? Like I know it's a way to incentivize people, but when you actually sit back and think about it, it's a bit bizarre that it's like, oh, you hired a black person, congratulations, let's give you an award. Um, and that that's not only tokenizing; it's almost like a bit insulting, and it uh, it almost suggests that we're not entitled to be there. And then you you have to ask if you had to create an environment that you know, where you could, and a pathway to bring Black people in, um, you know, what happens when they're in? Was the, Does the workplace accommodate the the Black people or whatever, you know, equity-seeking group that that, that that person belongs to? So um, I, I, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I, I've never thought about do my colleagues, you know, was I a, an equity hire? To my knowledge, no. Uh, but if somebody else looked at it that way, I, I wouldn't know. It wasn't communicated to me. Um, you know, did my colleagues look at me that way? Um, you know, my classmates, did me, they look at me that way? Uh, I don't know. It, it's a good uh, it's a good question. I've I've been very fortunate to have work in organizations and learn in environments where um, diversity was top of mind. Um, you know that I worked for a diversity institute at Ryerson University, and despite the the issues with the with the name of the university, there um, was a you know really safe place for Black people to be. Um, and Wendy Sukir was an amazing champion of diversity in the university and made sure that it was reflected. I would see her all hours of the night on LinkedIn commenting on news stories like, where are the women? How come there's all white people on the panel? <laughs> you know, so um, that was the environment that I was in. So it was always top of mind for me and I felt like fostered there. But I, I, I don't know what the experience has been like for other people where they came into an environment that didn't support um, you know, black hires or black students and um, whether their colleagues perceive them as be only being hired for that reason. Yeah, I'm just going to jump in here and I will turn it over to Prof and Aisha, but um, just to say two things. Number one, we're going to keep the conversation going for just a little bit, even though the time has ended. And so if anybody feels they need to leave right away, thank you for joining us. Uh, it's been amazing. I'm going to stay because I love this discussion <laughs> and I do have a bit of extra time. Um, the other thing I want to say is that um, the idea about these, uh, we'll just use it as an example, the awards um, for, for hiring, uh, it, I think it just means that the bar is low. I don't know that that's something that met, is meant to, I don't know, I think it's something that it's meant to aspire to. And, and Brittany, you touched on the points that it's it's kind of insulting. And, and my sister in the comments said it's kind of a reinforcement of, of the, in, the, 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 the things that are wrong with the way that hiring is done. Um, and so um, I think Dr. Uh, Dr. James in saying that um, if we're still asking for these things now, although that there's been legislation for um, hiring people from equ equity deserving groups, um, what, what it means is that we haven't been doing things the right way. Um, and that hiring committees, um, not just within academia, but outside of academia, need to, to think about the different ways of being and the different ways of knowing and the different um, skills that people bring given their diverse backgrounds, whether that's racial, gen gender, sexual, whatever. And some, and we all have something to bring to the table, but if the hiring committee is not privy to that or isn't thinking about it in that way, then they're limited in, in their capacity to uh, get the best people. And, and um, yeah, so I, I think I'll stop there uh, and I'll turn it over to, to Aisha. If you're still with us, I don't know if you are. I, I think Aisha might be. She might have left. Be, yes, prof. You know, I, I agree with everything that's been said. I think that, I, I think that I, I'm struggling to, to sort of articulate myself, but I, I think that there's something to be said for the metrics by which, you know, performance or, um, um, but by which you know performance is, is is measured in the academic space, right? Like we all know this, like 
those of us who are in grad school, it's all publications and, you know, um, it's, it's publications and conferences and, and whatnot. Um, but at the same time, there are lots of other engagements um, that, you know, <clears throat> particularly indigenous and black faculty engage in, um, most especially mentoring. Um, I know this because I'm a product of it. Um, um, and uh, and these and, and, and these sort of activities or these engagements are never ever rewarded or they're never ever noticed. These are not things that um, a lot of, a lot of this labor can't be a lot of this labor can't be articulated on on a CV or um, they they can't be mentioned. They can't be factored into you know whether somebody gets tenure track or not. So and I also think that you know. We, the, the model, the, the model by which people are measured, I, I think the, the, the metrics by which, you know, <clears throat> um, faculty, uh, particularly, you know, indigenous and black faculty are measured for me is completely flawed. Um, and that also requires some form of reimagination and won't form some form of rethinking. Again, it goes back to the earlier point of what happens after the higher, what happens after um, what happens after you get you get in the door, um, there's also something that I've I've also kind of I've, I've also kind of realized this, and I think it really boils down to so Eduardo Bonilla Silva is a is a, is a is a race scholar, and he talks about you know he's, he does his he's written a lot about colorblind racism, right? And in one of these concepts, he talks about abstract liberalism, where these um, and what it is is like there are these sort of goals around equality that, that are evoked to block. Um, so when you hear about cluster hires, it's like, why should there be cluster hires for black people? This should be, everyone should be given the equal opportunity. Or, you know, we, I don't care about, you know, the color, I don't, why, why should this particular group get this? It's, it's, a, it's a kind of liberalism that is evoked to, to block any kind of access to, or any kind of, you know, um, 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 a reward that's given to a particular group, particularly whether it's indigenous or black people. So sometimes I hear, um, you know, so sometimes I always find that that conversation about we need to reimagine this, it always comes about when there is something that's being given to, you know, to, to, to like a black person or when it's given to an indigenous person. It's like this whole system is flawed, but those conversations are never ever evoked when it's given to other people. You know, it's like, so it almost feels like we are then tasked with the, you know, we are then tasked with reimagining this whole system. You know what I mean? It's like, but I'm like, in order to reinvent the wheel, you have to be at the wheel first. Like, you know, we're not at the wheel. We're not at the wheel. Um, so I, I find that curious and it's something that I struggle with. And sort of that Bonilla Silva's concept of abstract liberalism really touches on that because it's then where people get into this like virtue of like, but I'm like, yes, we, we agree with all of this. Yes, the system is flawed, but why is this now a conversation when something is going to, you know, somebody else and not, and, and why is this being centered on, on our community? So that's also a question that I ask myself. So yeah, I don't know if that. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and what, what I like about that and what we want us to think about is, Will things have changed or is the system remaining the same, but we're now just hiring and we're just bringing in, but what you're asking for, what, what are some of the, are the indices or the, the kinds of uh, ideas that, that you need to start reimagining change in order to be able to bring these uh, other kinds of uh, racialized people in, into the institution. So, because we just can't continue to say, okay, if, if, if Black apply, you know, for how, you know, we have to start it. What were the system structures? What were the, the barriers that existed that must be dealt with that might have operated to not have uh, Black students, uh, Black young people, Black students uh, eventually go on to do PhDs or Black faculty members getting into the university or Black people, get it uh, becoming administrators. 
I know th th that's something that I, I really like uh, us to consider. What does it mean? Because if it's happening with with the structure remaining the same, therefore, well, uh, you know, after a while, it's it's not it's not going to go much further. There there were a number of other things that I, I quite like. The idea of collecting data. I think it was Brittany. Was it you, Brittany? That yeah, that talked about data and if you don't have data how do you know what's happening and if you if you collect data you should use the data beyond just simply uh saying we have data etc cetera, et cetera. but what's interesting consider this institutions that thrive on research that thrives on evidence don't have data about their students about their faculty members about those things why what don't they want to know why there's no data always one of my interesting questions that, that I always ask. And uh, the, one of the interesting thing that also, that's important for us to think about is, uh, what about this generation of undergraduate and graduate students? And I think it was, uh, it was Brittany and Evelyn might have elaborated. What, what's going with this virtual learning? How is it going to play out? What's going to happen to, I, I, I talked to some grade 12 students who, who are saying, I don't want to go to university this year because if I go to university, it's going to be virtual learning and I'm not going to get. And other students say, I'm leaving, uni I'm leaving high school and my last year of high school has been virtual learning. And I do not think I got the fulsome experience of, this, of my education to prepare myself for university. And therefore, I don't know if I'm ready. So there's a whole big generation here that that's absolutely critical for us to think about. Okay, Evelyn, I'm finished. <laughs> Sorry, Dr. James. That's because people are dropping off and I think they, they're missing, they feel they're missing out. And I mean, we could, we could, have, we could have done this for hours, but you're always so insightful. And, and I just need to, to say thank you. And unfortunately we need to wrap up. The sun is coming into my face because of the time of day. <laughs> I didn't expect to be here this long, but I'm so glad that we did. So just, just taking a few moments to say thank you, Dr. James, for joining us. I think um, we all really generally appreciated it. Um, Prof, did you raise your hand, Prof? Okay, mistake. <laughs> mistake. Yeah, thank you to, to Prof, Brittany, and, and Aisha for, for joining us today and sharing your insights about where we're at and where we're going. Truly insightful, and I think that everybody will, will say the same. So that's the last it. That's it. That's the last episode of my series, The Good and the Bad of Black Grad. I hope everybody learned something. I hope that you had some questions that you're living with. <laughs> and uh, who knows what will happen. Maybe we'll have a good black grad reunion in, in several years to see where we've all gone and, and what's what's become of all of our thoughts and ideas. Thank you to Dr. James, of course, for facilitating a great discussion. You're, you're, you're amazing. I will always be a fan girl.